second chapter, verse 1. Rama Om Vishnu Padaya, Vishnu Prasthaya Bhutali, Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani, Namaste Sarasati Devi, Guru Vasa Pacharya, Nirvi Sesa Sunya Bhadi, Saskati Vizatayam, Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nichananda, Shri Vaiti Gadha, Shri Vasa Vidhoda Bhaktivinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 2, Verse Number 9. Text 9. Sanjaya Uvacha Evam Uktva Rishikesham Evam Uktva Rishikesham Gudakesha Parantapa Gudakesha Parantapa Nayotsna Iti Govindam Nayotsna Iti Govindam Uktva Tusnim Babu Vaha Uktva Tusnim Babu Vaha Sanjaya said Having spoken thus, Arjuna, chastiser of enemies, told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Dhritarashtra must have been very glad to understand that Arjuna was not going to fight and was instead having the battlefield for the begging profession. But Sanjay disappointed him again in relating that Arjuna was competent to kill his enemies, Parantapa. Although Arjuna was, for the time being, overwhelmed with false grief by the family affection, he surrendered unto Krishna, the Supreme Spiritual Master, as a disciple. This indicated that he would soon be free from false lamentation resulting from, false, resulting from family affection and would be enlightened with perfect knowledge of self-realization or Krishna consciousness and would then surely fight. Thus, Dhritarashtra joy would be frustrated since Arjun would be enlightened by Krishna and would fight to the end. So several times it mentions false uh, lamentation. lamentation. So why does it say it's false lamentation? So because uh, actually human beings are basically are souls and uh, the bodily relations are like uh, temporary. So anything which related to the talk is uh, at, so, at soul per base, it is, uh, everyone is uh, eternal. So that's the Yeah, but I mean, therefore the, if it says false lamentation, there, there can be a real lamentation. So, so what is it exactly that Arjuna here is going so far as to say no to Krishna. He's not going to cooperate with Krishna. What is it exactly that? Well, he, he mentioned several times the family attachment. So I guess the question I'm going to ask, and I think we've discussed it already, what is the difference in real affection for the family and false attachment? then there's false lamentation. And then due to that lamentation, there's a refusal to follow Krishna's order. And you see how subtle Sanskrit can be just by using one word, Parantapa. Sanjaya is informing Dhritarashtra in a very, let's say, uh, not subtle, but uh, explicit way, but without being uh, too graphic. Parantapa means the chastiser of the enemies. So he's referring to Arjuna as, as Parantapa. That means Arjuna is, is on the righteous side. And he's going to punish the enemies, meaning Dhritarashtra's sons and followers. So, okay, so let's go back to this concept, that, you know, this false lamentation, uh, and let's look at exact words where it says, 
Although Arjuna was for the time being overwhelmed with false grief due to family affection, he surrendered unto Krishna, the supreme spiritual master, as a disciple. This indicated that he would soon be free from the false lamentation resulting from family affection and would be enlightened with perfect knowledge of self-realization of Krishna consciousness. So here's, you know, very, you know, Prabhupada makes, has made this point already several times before in the few verses that we've read. So, <clears throat> being attached, uh, okay, since false lamentation means he's lamenting because he will no longer have the type of sense gratification of his family attachment that he's been used to. In other words, something is going to come to an end. And that same thing happens uh, to everyone. Uh, like for example, let's say when your kids are growing up, then there's uh, a focal point for a husband and wife. The kids are an extension of themselves. And there's some joy in doing mundane things. Like, you know, anyway, I won't be graphic about it. There, there, there's, some, there's, there's some joy, you know, going on picnics or, you know, going, going to the water, uh, water slides and uh, things like that. So, uh, but then the kids grow up and that whole period is over when they were growing up and their total dependence and now they're independent and when they get married and then end up on the other side of the world. So, uh, something comes to an end that false, well you could call it the sense gratification. It's not a, a type of gross sense gratification, but it's it's that family attachment and what goes along with it, you know. Uh, and, but in this case, it's more severe because Arjuna has family on both sides and definitely some, or many of the family members are going to be killed. And there's going to be a change. It'll no longer be the same. So he's lamenting for that. He's lamenting for the fact that, that the, the mundane pleasures that he might have had plenty of before, because he's got a big extended family, right? it's all going to be finished. And people will die, and it will never be the same again. Well, that happens to all of us, not in such a <coughs> dramatic way. But, you know, as you get older, uh, things change, you know, kids grow up, people die, uh, relationships change, and you're just stuck with, you're just left with memories, but you can't go back to them, right? And this causes lamentation, but it's lamentation for sense gratification that can no longer continue. It's not real... Uh, it's nothing real as far as uh, one's eternal relationship with Krishna. So, uh, even amongst Vaishnavas, there's, you know, Ye Nilo Premadana, the song that we sing when, uh, on disappearance days of great Vaishnavas. And it's a song of somewhat lamentation, but when lamenting, for the, uh, let's say, lack of association of that great personality. But it's not a lamentation like uh, uh, for sense gratification. It's, it's just an appreciation of what that person has given us in terms of knowledge and, and association and positive Krishna conscious experiences. Uh, so, in one sense, it's a glorification of that person, that particular song that we sing, and at the same time, uh, there is a feeling of some lamentation that, you know, we're missing that great association.
But there's no sense gratification involved in it. It's, it's purely on the level of the soul. But here, what happens when, you know, when, we, when we remember great Vaishnavas, it makes our resolve stronger to continue serving. When we remember, when Arjuna's case, his resolve to serve is, is, is uh, shattered, it's, it's shredded. He, 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 Krishna's standing right in front of him, he looks at him in the face and says, no, I'm not going to fight. So, that's a sign of sense gratification. And that's why it's, the lamentation is false. Because it leads to him saying no to Krishna. In the other case, when we, chant, when we chant that yeya nilo prima dana, uh, uh, that remembrance of the Vaishnava makes our resolve, our determination, our enthusiasm stronger to continue in Krishna consciousness. Okay. So, falena parichyate. One has to judge from the results. So in this case, the result is Arjuna becomes less Krishna conscious because of his family attachment. So therefore the family attachment is Maya. Anything that takes us away from Krishna is Maya, illusion. And illusion, uh, the synonym of illusion is sense gratification. And another one is called Maya. Right. So, and that's explained in the fourth chapter. Let's just take a look at that first. What is it? Synonym? Synonym and, means a word that means the same thing. Maya. Maya or sense gratification. And or illusion. Oh, all illusion. three. Mm-hmm. So if you look in the fourth chapter, twenty-fourth verse, and in the purport somewhat in the middle of the purport it says everything that exists is situated in that Brahma Jyoti but when the Jyoti is covered by illusion, maya or sense gratification it is called material. The material veil can you, you see that in the purport? Yeah. The material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness. So we see illusion, maya, or sense gratification. So this false lamentation is maya because it's based on sense gratification. Whereas lamenting, because we're missing the association of a great Vaishnava, is not the same because it doesn't lead to illusion. It's not based on sense gratification. It's based on genuine gratitude for the association of that Vaishnava, which makes our determination stronger to continue serving. Okay. Any questions about this verse? Good. So we're going to text 10. Tam uvacha kishikesha Prahasan Iva Bharata Senayor Upayor Madhye Visidanta Midam Bacha O descendant of Bharata, at that time Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief stricken Arjuna. wants to read the purple. Yes. His talk was going on between intimate friends, namely the Hrishikesha and the Buddhakesha. So Hrishikesha means the uh, the Sense-kesha. owner of the senses. Isha. Hrishika Isha. Isha means he's the uh, controller of the senses. And Gudakesha means one who has uh, vanquished over ignorance and sleep. Yeah. So Arjuna is Gudakesha and Krishna is Rishikesha. Go ahead. As friends, both of them were on the same level, 
but one of them voluntarily became a student of the other. Krishna was smiling because a friend had chosen to become a disciple. As Lord of all, he was always... Okay, so now that's a significant point. If someone decides to surrender to Krishna, does it make him happy or sad? Happy. Happy. Right. So you want to make Krishna happy? Yeah. What should you do? Surrender. Yeah. He is, he is always in the superior position as the master of everyone, and yet the Lord agrees to be a friend, a son, or a lover for a devotee who wants him in such a role. But when he was accept, accepted as the master, he at once assumed the role and talked with the disciple like the master, with gravity, as it is required. It appeared that the talk between the master and the disciple were open, was. Open, was openly exchanged in the presence of both armies so that all were benefited. So the talks of Bhagavad Gita are not for any particular person, society or community, but they are for all, and friends or enemies are equally entitled to hear them. So when this conversation that took place between Krishna and Arjuna was heard by many other people. So Prabhupada Gurak is so, uh, Arjuna, so at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. So Gurak is under illusion. So at this point he is under illusion. And what, how do, you know, you might say, well, well, why should he have this name Gudakesha? It means he conquers over ignorance. But he is in ignorance. He's refusing Krishna's order. But it's just like a person, uh, two people decide to jump out of an airplane. One of them has a parachute and the other doesn't. So the guy with the parachute, he's actually Gudakesha. And the guy without the parachute, he's not. What's Kudakish. Kudakish again? One who has conquered over ignorance. So, if the guy jumps out of the airplane without a, without a parachute, how much of a chance does he have to survive? Well, not much. Is it in water? No. <laughs> no it's on a mountain. On, on a mountain. Oh. Well, even if you're on the water, you die. Yeah. So, even though Arjuna... Seemingly is in ignorance, but he's surrendered to Krishna. So that means he has a great future. Right? He, see, this is the problem. Most people, when they become troubled in their mind uh, because of you know, contrary situations in life, uh, they don't seek spiritual help. And therefore, it's like the guy jumping out of the airplane without the parachute. He forgot to put it on. Right. But here, Arjuna is in deep trouble, but he's not uh, averse to taking advice from Krishna. And he's going to surrender to Krishna and say, you tell me what to do, Krishna, because I'm confused. So that's a sign of good occasion, someone who's going to, who has the potential of conquering over ignorance, you know. He was smart enough to put on a parachute before he jumped out of the airplane. So, uh, and that's why Krishna is smiling, because he's thinking, ah, this Arjuna, although he's, he's in Maya, but he's still not that much in Maya that he's refusing to talk to me and get advice from me. Right? But when someone is, you know, doesn't want to talk to anyone spiritual, get any spiritual advice, they're really in Maya. I mean, they're jumping out of the airplane without a parachute. Okay. So let's, who's going to, uh, did you finish it? Did you finish reading? Yeah. Did you finish reading? Yeah. Okay. So as soon as he accepts Krishna, uh, and he's already accepted Krishna, something changed. What changed? No, they're no longer talking like buddy-buddy. 
Now it becomes serious. And right away Krishna is going to chastise him. That's what happens when you have a real guru. He, the guru, one meaning of guru means heavy. He's, he's heavy with knowledge and therefore uh, when he sees something that is very detrimental for Krishna consciousness, he will point it out. It's like the surgeon. The surgeon has to cut out cancerous growth within the body. So he takes his knife, right? And he sticks it in your body, and makes a cut, right? And they open up, and there's blood. And they have to put a suction cup there to suck the blood because it's coming out. And then he's going around separating this organ, that organ, and he sees, now he sees the cancerous thing, and he cuts it out. And then there's more blood, and then they suck out more blood. And then they stop the bleeding, and then he has to sew it up, you know, and then they give you big shots of antibiotics and other things. And uh, and there it is, that cancerous growth, that gooey, ugly-looking thing that would kill you if you didn't cut it out. So, uh, now... Is it the same thing when the surgeon cuts you open and there's blood all over the place and a thief cuts you open? Is it the same thing? No. No. It looks the same, but it's not the same thing. So that's what the guru does. He surgically gives you a stab. No, not like that. You would go to jail if you did that. He surgically gives you a stab to cut out the cancer. What is the cancer? It's misconceptions. But misconceptions are so strong that it requires, you know, a scalpel or a knife sometimes to cut it out. So now we're going to see what Krishna says. You know, now the friendly talk is over. Oh, how are you? Are you okay? Hari Bo. And where did you go last night? What did you eat? And... Uh, What's, uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? You know, it's all finished now. Now they're talking about, you know, what's Krishna conscious, what's not Krishna conscious. Okay. And, obviously, this is a public discussion. It's not a private discussion. So other people are hearing it on the battlefield. And we are hearing it today. If it was a private discussion, we wouldn't be able to hear it. Sanjaya is hearing it, Dhritarashtra is hearing it, the Kurus are hearing it, the uh, Pandavas are hearing it. So it's for everybody's benefit. Even the Devatas are hearing it. It's for the, everybody's benefit. Okay. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Sochanan Vasochastvam. Pragnavadam Shabasase Gatasam Agatus Agatasam Cha Nana Sucham Tipanditaha The Supreme Personality of God had said, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead. So basically, he's, now he's speaking seriously. It's no longer, hello, how you doing? What's new? How's the family? Uh, how's your 401k doing? And, uh, it's all finished now. Now he's, basically, he's telling Arjuna, you're a fool. You're an idiot. What's a 401k? A 401k, it's less than a 402k, and it's more than a 40k. Okay, you got the answer? No. no. 401k is the money that's put aside for you in your business, in, in a business when you're an employee for your retirement. So it means that you're getting richer, but it's like candy that's in a lockbox. You can see it, but you can't touch it. Okay. okay. You want to read the purple? Yeah. The same Vedic truth given to Where are you? 
Verse oh. number 11. The Lord at once took the position of the teacher and chastised the student, calling him indirectly a fool. So what's chastising? Like, severely for good hurting well, well, mentally with words. No, well, chastise means you, uh, well, you you're like, uh, are uh, saying, so, you're telling the truth, but it hurts the person. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. I'm sorry to say the truth, but you got one. Okay. Um, calling him indirectly a fool. The Lord said, you are talking like a learned man, but you do not know what the one, that one who is learned, one who knows that, what is body and what is soul does not lament for any stage of the body, neither in the living nor the dead condition. Nor in the dead condition. In the dead condition. As explained in later, later chapters, it will be clear that no knowledge means to know matter and spirit on the controller of both. Arjuna argued that religious principles should be given more importance than politics or socialist sociology. So, sociology, but he did not know that knowledge of matter, soul, and the supreme is even more important than religious formularies. And because he was lacking in that knowledge, he should not have posed himself as a very, very learned man. As he did not happen to be a very learned man, he was consequently lamenting for something that which was unworthy of lamentation. The body is born and destiny to and be, is destined and is destined to be vanquished today or tomorrow. Therefore, the body is not as important as the soul. One who knows this is actually learned, and for him there is no cause for lamentation, regardless of the condition of the material body. Okay, so this is a very profound purport. There are a lot of major points here, and we're going to go over it slowly. So, the Lord takes a position as a teacher and chastises the student. He points out the faults. That's, a guru can do that. He's not a fault finder in the sense that he finds trivial faults. He finds faults that are obstacles to making spiritual advancement in the life of the disciple. And those, that's, that's not a fault finding, basically. That is truth finding. It's uh, pointing out the truth by which one can overcome their uh, shortcomings in life. Shortcoming means uh, not becoming Krishna conscious. So Krishna immediately puts his finger on the on the on the point. What is the point? Here's a man who is speaking very noble words, but he was doing it to mask his sense gratification. For example, once upon a time, uh, there was a uh, story straight. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, there was a. Uh, a rooster, and the rooster had a friend who was a dog. So one day, they were living on a farm, and the, the rooster said to the dog, you know, every once in a while I jump up on the roof and I can see this nice areas in the distance. Have you ever been there? And the dog said, rough, rough, no. So. The rooster said, bah, 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 uh, why don't we go there? And the dog said, roof, roof, yes. So they both left the farm and they started traveling together. And nighttime came. So the rooster said, bah, bah, I'm going to go up on the tree, safer up there. And the dog said, roof, roof, 
I'm going to hide under the bushes. It's safer for me. So the next morning, the rooster did his cockle doo doo doo, and there was a fox that woke up and said, Oh, there's food in the neighborhood. What does that mean? There's food in the neighborhood. It's you know? good. Huh? He's going to eat like, the chicken. Yeah. The rooster. The rooster. So he, he goes toward the, uh, the cockle doo 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 sound, and he sees his big fat rooster up on the tree. And he says, and he, he says Oh, brother rooster, he said. Brother rooster, how are you? Good morning. How's everything going? Rooster looks down. Who are you? He said, Oh, I'm your brother dog. I mean, I'm your brother fox. Oh. And he said, uh, what brings you to these uh, uh, far off places? And Rooster said, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm traveling and seeing the world. And the, and, the, and the fox said, oh, that's good. I am too. You know, it's, it's, it's no fun doing it alone. You know, why don't we go together? And the rooster said, oh, okay. He said, but I have a friend with me too. He said, oh, yeah. And immediately the fox thought, there's another Another, probably a chicken, right? So he thought, I'll eat the chicken first, and I'll come back and eat the rooster. <laughs> so really, where's where, where, where's your friend? Looks like he didn't wake up yet. Oh, he, he's a sleepyhead. She's a sleepyhead, he said. Oh, where where is she? So he's in the bushes over there. He said, okay, well, I'll go wake her up, and then I'll come back, and we can go traveling together. He said, oh, good. So the fox goes over, and he's, he's sniffing around, and... Uh, he thinks he sees something, he jumps on it, and he wakes the dog up, and the dog kills him. Okay, so, uh, this is what happens to people who uh, speak big, big words, but their motivation is sense gratification. It's not really... Uh, genuine. Is it like, I was thinking at first, like, there's a kid in my class who's, um, who likes rockets, and he's talking all these big, big things, but then um, all of us don't understand what it is. It's like science and all. But then one um, person in my class, another person, he, he actually studies and researches about those stuff, and whatever that kid was saying about rockets was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well... Is it kind of like that? No. <laughs> I was thinking that at first. Yeah, of course. No, everything Arjuna said in the previous chapter one was correct. But it was not... It's just like this. Like, say, there's two lawyers. One is... Uh, defending the accused person, the other one is, is prosecuting the accused person, right? So, both of them use arguments from the law books. One to uh, convict the defendant, and the other one to uh, exonerate the defendant, right? And now there's a judge. Now he hears both arguments, they're both based on the law, law books. And he has to decide which one is more correctly interpreting the law for the particular situation of the crime committed, right, or whatever, alleged crime. So you have two lawyers. They're using the same law books, one to convict and one to exonerate. Right? And then the judge has to decide which one is more correct. So, uh, even though everything Arjuna said was correct, in that particular context, he was using it in order to uh, in order to uh, let's say escape doing his duty and uh, entering into a comfort comfort zone where he could avoid the Battle of Kurukshetra. Okay. 
So, he was speaking like a wise man, but he actually, he was not wise at all. He was actually a, an ordinary person in illusion. But he used all these beautiful arguments that can confuse a normal person. Just like, if you didn't have that other friend in your class who actually researched, researches rockets and knows something about them, then you might have thought that the, the, the person that uses these big words and talks about rockets actually knows something. Yeah, we all thought like Broadwood was so smart, well that guy is so smart in rockets, until the other kid came up and told me everything he was saying is wrong. Right. So in the case of Arjuna, it's more subtle. Everything he's saying is right. But in the context of, uh, in front of Krishna, uh, Krishna could see the motive. Now, motive, you know what a motive is? The reason like, behind. Yeah. The real reason. The real reason was he didn't want to fight. He didn't want to do his duty. And it was because he was attached to his family on both sides of the battlefield. And he found these fantastic arguments that are correct in certain circumstances, in normal circumstances, to, to mask his sense gratification, to mask his personal interest. <laughs> He was not thinking about, how can I please Krishna? He was only thinking about, how can I please himself? But he used these wonderful arguments that any normal person would get confused by. It's just like the politicians. like the, They do this all the time. Whenever they want to get some new legislation passed, right? You know, like, more money for the schools, right? So you see these signs, you know, vote yes on... Proposition 342 for Issaquah schools or for Sammamish schools, right? So it sort of touches the heart of everyone, you know, schools, education, you know. We want our kids to do better, you know. So, so then people agree to raise taxes on themselves. Right? But most of the time, uh, the, well, it depends where it is, but, you know, the schools around here are pretty good, but still... What did they learn in the schools? You know, by the way, originally in Vedic times, there were no like schools with like five thousand people in it. Right. How many how many kids are in your school? Well, the new um, the middle school that I'm gonna go to, there are about like I don't know, three hundred. My school has about seven hundred. Yes, seven hundred. Seven hundred. Like my school right now. Yeah. Well, when you get to high school, there'll be like four or five thousand kids. Right. So previously it was not like that. Previously, every village had one or several Brahmins, and the Brahmins would have, you know, five kids, ten kids. That's it. That was it. Right. And it was really good education. Other kids. It was a good education program. Yeah, it was very good, and it was free. Once a year, you had to give uh, don, or you had, you had to give some uh, charity to the Brahmana, to the teacher. But there was no like, you know. 10,000 kids or 5,000 kids or 1,500 kids and, you know, 30 kids in the classroom or, yeah. But what happened to the other kids? Like, <coughs> the yeah. other kids who Which kids? The other, like, let's say there are 5,000 kids. Um, no, 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 yeah. This is mostly villages. There were no gigantic oh. towns. Oh, there, were, mm -hmm. there, were, there were villages. There were, little, there were bigger villages, smaller villages, but they were, they were all self-sufficient villages, you know. Right now, even now in India, I think, you, or well, at, at Independence, there were 700,000 villages in India. I don't know how many there are now. So that's a lot of villages, right? 700,000 villages, right? And of course, there were big cities too, uh, you know, at Independence of India. But before that, most, there were, there, were, there were some villages, there were some big cities, but not a lot. Like there was Dwarka. But Dwarka, I mean, if you count, Krishna had 16,000 wives, over 16,000 wives, and he had 10 sons with each wife, and obviously they were girls also. So, you know, uh, 10 times uh, okay, 16,000 is 160,000. So, you know, there could have been like half a million or... <laughs> one million, one million people in Dwarka, right? I'm not sure. I'm just guessing now. I'm not absolutely sure, but 
It was not like, you know, 25 million people like Delhi, you know, or a place like that. So, uh, therefore, uh, education was much more personal and much more, uh, let's say, uh, contained. And, and uh, the students were trained. Like Krishna went to school, right? In his school, in uh, Sandipani Muni, there were not like 50, 100 kids. Were, I think just a handful of kids. And, and, uh, and they, Krishna learned the 64 arts and so many things. You know, uh, it was a very good education. And the whole education was based on building character. Now, are they building character in your class? Like, what do you mean? Like, building your Honesty, cleanliness. No. Oh, yeah, always. They're, well, not cleanliness because they're always eating meat and, like, they're cute. There's mer they're not following mercy and cleanliness. They're but like, like, there was one kid in my school. Like, he didn't sit in my class, but he just, like, was talking to me and my friend randomly. Like, he just came up and he said, I feel very clean. I take a bath once in five days now. <laughs> That's not really. They're, um, no, the teachers uh, character, are, um, character means building, like, yeah. <coughs> honest, clean, merciful, self controlled, right? Qualities they, like that. They say, like, be nice, be kind, yeah. honesty. Yeah. Okay, so, alright, so they say that. Now, are the kids like that? No. No. Huh? They say it like they so say, boring. Uh, Even the recess teachers don't like that. They say responsible. For, like, you have to be responsible yeah. with the school materials. You have to be responsible. Yeah. You have to walk in the hallways and in the, when you're walking. And like for self control, you, you you can't really harm anyone. Or you can't like hit. Like, like self control means like you keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. Like it's not like what we learn in, in like what Krishna is talking about. Well, no. Okay. Uh, are the kids doing that? No. Nobody, nobody okay, so you see, uh, these are character traits. And in the Vedic education, the whole point is to build character. And along with the character, you know, uh, like for example, the eight, the twenty points of knowledge: Amanit bam, madamit bam, ahimsa santiraja bam, acharya pasman socham. Starya Matma Vinigraha, look up 13th chapter, 8th to 12th verse. Indriyate Suvaira Gyam Anahamkara Evacha Jana Mekya Jana. 13th chapter, 8th to 12th verse. Jana Mekya Jana Vyadi Dukudo Sanadarshanam Asakti Dana Visvanga Putra Dara Gehadisu. Nityam cha samachitatva istani stopa padisu maichananya yogena bhakti ravya vichari nai vivita desa se vitvam arati yujana samsadi adhyatma jnana nitatva tatva jnana arta dasana itaj jnana tiproktam adhyana yad ato nyata. So, uh, who's going to read the ch translation of that? Who's going to read that? Okay, Arush, go ahead. Humility, pridelessness, non-violence, tolerance, simplicity, 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 approaching... Which means a honesty and like that. Yeah. Approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness steadiness, self-control, ren renunciation, renunciation, ren of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the rep perception. perception of evil, of birth, death, old age, and disease, detachment, freedom, and entanglement, the children, wife, home, and the rest. Even mind, mind even mindedness, amidst. Mindedness, Pleasant. And unpleasant. Men, pleasant. Events. Events and unpleasant events. Consent and unalloyed devotion to me. 
aspiring to live in a solitary, solitary place, detachment from the general mass of people, accepting the importance of self-realization and his philosophical search for the absolute truth. All these I declare to be knowledge and besides this whatever there may be is ignorance. Yeah, like rockets. Right? So whatever there may be besides these 20 points is considered ignorance. This is Krishna speaking. He's explaining the 20 points of real knowledge. This is what was taught in the schools of the gurus and the, and the brahmins. And this is character. Amanitvam, Adamitvam, you know, humility is number one. And freedom from false pride. Ahimsa, nonviolence. And Ahimsa, Santir. Peacefulness. Uh, tranquility. Arjavam, honesty, simplicity. And then accepting a bona fide spiritual master. I mean, these are the points that are taught. This is called real knowledge. Anything besides this is considered ignorance. So are you learning any of this stuff? No. Are you learning any of Okay. All the bad things I've learned and people are saying now, it's from school. Yeah. School is supposed to be for learning. But mostly bad things are coming, like public schools. Yeah. Prabhu, the example which you gave about a rooster dog, or um, I, I don't remember if you mentioned that. In which context did you say that? Are you asking? Well, the do the the fox was speaking really nice, you know, trying to make friends with the rooster. But what was his purpose? to eat the rooster, right? So he was using nice words and he was speaking like a friend, but, but actually it was just to mask his real purpose. And then when the rooster, rooster outsmarted the, the fox, he said, well, I have a friend of mine with me. Immediately the fox saw another chicken or something in his mind, right? Because he's a crooked, crooked person, right? So the, the, the rooster outsmarted the fox. Although usually the fox can outsmart the rooster, but wait, was the rooster like? Did the rooster like know the fox was gonna try? Of course. <laughs> you don't think chickens know that foxes are their enemies? I thought like at first I thought yeah. the rooster was being dumb. Yeah, same. No, the rooster outsmarted the fox. And I thought the fox would kill the fox. Yeah, you also yeah, because the like, I thought foxes <laughs> 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 no, foxes are not. No, these animals, they, they have that much of knowledge, like, uh, whom they should be like, staying away from. Yeah. They have this internal knowledge. Foxes, so foxes are very, very strong when there's no one else around, and it's just a, a rooster. Then they're, they're going to eat the rooster for sure. But if there's a dog protecting the, the rooster, sure. fox won't go near it. So that it was in that kind. So Arjuna is not he's not as evil as the fox, right? But he was trying to hide his personal motive by using this grandiose language and grandiose thoughts, you know. And uh, and Krishna saw through it right away because Krishna could see his motive, just like the rooster could understand the motive of the dog. I mean the fox, yeah. Uh, there's another example. This one you probably know. There was once a, uh, a cat, but the cat was getting old. So he was thinking, you know, I'm not able to catch so many mouse mice anymore. Yeah, you probably know this. So he decided to pretend to be a yogi. Oh, yeah, I read this. Oh, yeah, yeah. The pious cat. Yeah. Right. So he was he was doing yoga like yeah. this, standing on one foot, you know, <laughs> and saying, "Oh," and the the mice saw this and they were thinking, "Oh, wow, he never 
saw a yogi cat. So they started very cautiously walking closer and they were looking and he kept going, oh. And, and then they called other mice and he was like, they had never seen a yogi cat. It's, it's a phenomenon. So there was a whole bunch of mice and they were all looking at the cat, but they're still staying at a distance, you know. And the cat kept, oh, like this. And then one of the mice went a little closer and said, are you a cat? I was before, but now I'm a, I'm a yogi. He said, a yogi? He said, yes, peace, brother, peace. And they said, you don't want to eat us? No, no, I'm a vegetarian now. So this brought more mice, you know, and this became a phenomenon. And then, uh, uh, then the king of the mice came, you know, and he said, what is this? Said, it's a yogi cat. So there's no such thing as a yogi cat. No, this one is a yogi. So the king went a little closer. Are you a yogi? He said, oh, yes. So the king said, wow, this is interesting. You, know, you don't want to eat us? Said, no, I'm a vegetarian. He's a vegetarian. You know, he's like us. You know, he's a vegetarian. You know. So then, uh, so, you know, after a little while, the mice, you know, they get tired of looking at the cat. So the yogi. So they start going away, and the last mouse that stays around, the cat would jump on it and eat it. So as time went on, the king saw that the number of mice were decreasing, and the cat was getting fatter. But he's a yogi, he doesn't eat mice, right? So he was trying to figure this out. How come the cat's getting fatter and all the mice are, you know? So then he figured it out, that the cat's not really a yogi. Yeah. So. Here, Arjuna, he said, Arjuna is not evil. He's a good person. But when you have even one material desire, it can ruin everything. Just one material desire. Not, right? And most people have hundreds, millions of material desires. Right? So uh, it, it, ruins, it ruins, what does it ruin? It ruins the 18 principles of knowledge, the 20 principles of knowledge. Humility, pridelessness, cleanliness, etc. So you're, you're that one student takes a bath once every five days and he feels clean now, right? I had a friend, he was a friend of mine, he was a devotee, and he told me when he went, when he was younger, uh, he would, uh, in his family, they would take a bath once a week. This is in England. Once a week. Yeah, and there was a real bath. They'd fill the bathtub with water. And first the father would get in, soap up and rinse. Then the mother would get in and she would soap up and rinse. And he was like, you know, the fourth kid. So he was the last one to get into the tub. Right? And, and that was just the way they lived, you know, because, you know, they were not like rich, so they had to conserve, they had to be, they had to be conservative with everything, including the water, because they have to pay for the water. Right? So they would, they would just fill the bathtub and everyone would take would go into the bathtub one at a time and they'd take their bath. Have you ever done anything like that? No. No, even in India they don't do that, right? But that that was the life, normal life in England. Are these people who want to set the world record for not bathing? So bathing, they, not bathing. 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 And then they stay like, they don't bath for like six, seven bathe. years. Bathe. Six, seven years. They don't take a bath or they don't bathe. They don't and take a bath. In, in the Guinness World Records, also there are these like really dirty people. Like there was this one Indian person who grew one of his hands nails to like thirty feet long. I've seen a person like that in India. There are people like that in India. They come every once in a while. But probably in poor countries, like um, earlier days, it would be like they they won't be able to get a warm water to take a bath. So it makes sense why they are so. Like yeah, I mean, they, like I said, you know, they were they were not rich, right? So they had the here we are living in a very like um, only when this establishment is done, that's why we are able to live. Otherwise, it's impossible to stay in this cold country. Well, I mean, you can take a sponge bath where you hardly use any water, right? You just use a, a little bit of water and you can sponge yourself down and you can dry yourself off, you know. There are many ways to get around this, you know. 
even if you're poor, you know, even the poorest people in India, like you, you go to Cal Calcutta, the people living on the street, they'll open up a fire hydrant and they take a bath right in the street. You know, I've seen fire that. Fire hydrant. Yeah. So even there's some stories where uh, the king also got like you now he bathed only three times in his lifetime, like you know when he was born, married, and maybe when he was he was dead. So it is by choice they did, they did that. So it, that bathing thing wasn't there so much prevalent in Europe that time. That is what uh, they wanted to say. Actually, in Europe, in the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, they didn't have toilets. In, in Versailles, Versailles is the big palace of Louis XIV and Louis XVI. There were no toilets. The people would step outside of their room and pass stool right on the marble floor. And then the, and the servants would come and clean it up. Stool and urine, they would clean it up. And I heard they used them. Huh? In France, in the king's palace, Louis XIV's palace. In the what? Of course, they had servants, but they had the same thing in in, Cal in uh, Bengal. I went to a village uh, in the 1970s, and uh, there was no real toilet. It, it was a uh, uh, yeah, there was a walk, and this house was a little higher, so there was one uh, outhouse. You go to outhouse, but the outhouse, there was just a shaft, and you would poop in the shaft and it would fall into the walk, which is maybe 10 feet below. And then uh, these people would come once a week. Uh, two guys would come once a week. They'd take two sides of the walk and they'd take it away. And that was, that was the toilet. And then they would compost it somewhere. They'd compost it somewhere right? And that was in Bengal. And, and, but, but it was... Actually, it's cleaner than having a toilet in the house because it was outside of the house, right? And they would they would they would bathe before they go back into the house. So, in a sense, it was even cleaner than what we have. So, there are many different ways to do things, in different cultures. Okay, so we're getting off the t topic now. So. Uh, Krishna tells, uh, he begins to chastise Arjuna. Uh, why? Because Arjuna is lamenting for what's not worthy of uh, lamenting. He's lamenting over the bodies of his relatives, rather than thinking about the souls of his relatives. And because of that, it affects him so much that he refuses to follow Krishna's order. So we, did we read number 11? Yes. Now, there's other points in this purport. Prabhupada explains what is knowledge. What does he say? How does he explain knowledge? Huh? Matter and spirit? No. Yeah, he mentions matter, but it's just not just matter and spirit. Matter, soul, and supreme. No. Now, yeah, he says that, that you have to know what is matter, what is spirit, meaning the individual soul, and who is the controller of both. That's called jnana. Okay. Now, Arjuna is arguing that religious principles should be given more importance than politics or sociology. That's correct. But it's not the complete story. That's like half the hen. There was once a farmer, and his son, and his son said, Dad, I got a great idea. We can make so much more money if you follow this idea I have. And the father said, OK, what's your idea? He said, look, the chicken, we have to feed it here, and it drops the egg here. Why don't we just cut the head off? We don't have to feed it anymore. We just get the egg. Is that a good idea? No, it won't The kid's not smart. Yeah, and the father said, well, he said, that's not a good idea. Uh, because if you cut the head off, the chicken dies, you won't get any more eggs. So, uh, Arjuna's 
uh, what is he doing? He's arguing on religious principles. And he says, religious principles should have precedence over uh, politics and sociology, right? And that is correct. But he's ignoring a higher principle than that. And the higher principle is that knowledge of matter, soul, and the supreme is even more important than religious formularies. What does that mean, religious formularies? Yes? And the principles of science? Well, not exactly. What? Yeah, now you're getting closer, yeah. Like, for example, what's one religious formula? Religious rituals? Yeah, rituals, right? Uh, like Satyanarayana Puja, Archana. Uh, or what most people do is that when they go to a temple in India, they walk in, they don't necessarily bow down and just go like this. And then they say some prayers, and you know, go like that, like that, and they go like this, and they go like, go like that, like that. You know. Maybe they turn around once, and then uh, you know, they basically they just walk out. Is that right? <laughs> so that's you know, going to the temple, right? Uh, there, there's no class. There's no. DYS, discover yourself. And uh, if they get some prasadam, it's just like a little piece of uh, sugar. Mishri. Mishri. Okay. And. Dandavad Dandavad, yeah. And it lasts maybe, you know, it lasts maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes maximum. I remember once uh, there was a. Uh, I was invited to go to a jagran, a Devi, Devi jagran. So, Mata, right? So, uh, it started around 8.30. So, so, there was one family I saw that came in. I knew them very well. And they, come, they, they would come to the temple every once in a while. So, they came in. They sat down. And in like, say, half an hour, the father looked at his wife and the kids said, like this. That means that's it. It's over. We're, we're leaving. <laughs> he just got up and walked out. So I mean, everyone else is planning on staying all night long. You know, I mean, they officially came. They had their presence there. You know, they can't say they didn't come. And then they just walked out. And, and, and you know, it was like that's the way most people are. They don't just come to the temple. It's just a formulary. It's just a formal thing. It's a uh, it's not even fully ritualized, right? Okay, they have, and they come to see, and then they go. There's not not really any connection uh, spiritually. It's just a, a formal thing. Yeah. But isn't that better than the people who don't come to the temple at all? Maybe, maybe not. Depends. <laughs> uh, in one sense, it's a good thing to come to the temple. And they also, they also give a little donation, right? So, you know, they come in with a, with a bunch of, uh, you know, one dollar bills. Everything is planned out ahead of time, right? And everyone in the family, you know, the father will give everyone a dollar bill, you know. You know everyone will come in and put a dollar bill. They say sometimes they give the kid the money for the kid to put, I don't know why. Even my dad does that sometimes. Maybe we bring money. Well, no, he's teaching you that you yeah. should offer to Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not bad. Yeah. But like, I just don't know why. That's that's the whole point. See, you don't have to know why. You just have to do it. That's what why it says a religious formula. It's a, you don't have to know the reason behind it. You're just supposed to do it. And then now you did your duty. Now you can walk out. And that's why it says that uh, okay. 
una pece dato che sua dica la tradi su bohomna isha di in other words that people go on pilgrimage to take a bath but not to associate with genuine sadhus in the holy places and hear from them so if they go and they take a bath they think oh I did my duty and I get, you know, they, they put a few rupees in the, and then they pray, please let my business do better, you know, or let, give me more health or something. And then that's a formulary. It's, that's not, not a real uh, spiritual experience. Of course, there, there's some spirituality involved in it. You're going to the pilgrimage. But it's more for, like, people who go to Kumbh Mela. What is it that brings them to Kumbh Mela? What do you think? There are people looking to do so they say that they are auspicious. Auspicious and every 12 years uh, one of the river in India get uh, like uh, some super uh, natural power. So whoever bathes it get a spiritual power. Yeah, they believe that there's some Amrit that Amrit falls from the heaven and, uh, in that particular place. And if they can take a bath and get that Amrit, then they attain immortality. Does that sound like it's a spiritual reason? But we, it's just like going to a casino, you know, playing the... Playing the uh, no, but there is no the machine, any. like, what do you call that? The slot machine, right? You keep putting money in and go like this, like that, and you hit the jackpot. So they want to, they're going there to get the jackpot. They get some umrit on your body. That means you're going to be immortal. Does it actually work? Huh? Does it work? I don't think so. I don't think now, so. There's some benefit because you're bathing in the Ganges, so there's benefit there. Well, like it depends and on your intention. Like, no, but the idea is, uh, it's not a bad thing. Just like here, Krishna, what, what, is, what is being said here? Let's look back at the text. The whole idea is to understand what's being said. What does he say? It will be clear that knowledge means to know matter and spirit and the controller of both. Arjuna, all right, don't do that. Look at the text. It's not that it's that way, right? Second chapter, 11th verse. Arjuna argued that religious principles should be given more importance than politics or sociology. But he did not know that knowledge of matter, soul, and the su supreme or super soul is even more important than religious formularies. And because he was lacking in that knowledge, he should not have posed himself or pre pretended to be a very learned man. And he pretended to be very learned. He gave tremendous arguments why he should not fight. But those arguments were based on his desire not to fight, not to follow Krishna's order. So, uh, he was not thinking in a spiritual way. He was thinking in a material way. And Krishna saw it right away. Most people can't see it. Most people read the first chapter and said, what, what a wonderful person Arjuna is. And he is a wonderful person. But he has very cleverly masked his real motive. And masked it behind religious uh, principles. So therefore, in, in, in any religion, there, is, there are sub-religious principles and superior religious principles. The sub-religious principles are based on getting material benefits by, by performing religious activity. And the uh, superior religious principles are developing pure love of God. Okay. So this is a major theme in the Bhagavad Gita. And the same problem is in every religion. Some people are following it for material benefit. And some people are following it because they genuinely want to attain love of God. And, and through service and through cultivating humility, pridelessness, tolerance, honesty, nonviolence, etc. Right. So, in spirit, real spiritual life, people develop character. 
In material life, they develop wealth and power and prestige. So there's a, there's a world of difference between the two. So if you develop wealth, power, prestige, uh, you can still be a bad person. And we're seeing that, if you're reading the newspapers nowadays in America, you're seeing all these big guys, they're all being uh, revealed to be abusers and, uh, let's say, sense gratification maniacs. Maniacs. Crazy people. And they're hurting a lot of people. You know. And they're very big guys. Right? Is that right? You're reading, you're reading it. Every, yeah. Yeah. Any religion that teaches pure love of God is valid. If a person attains real love for God and, and acts like that and develops all these good qualities, it's, it's a valid uh, path. Right? Doesn't matter they did it through Christianity or Islam or Judaism. It doesn't matter. What matters is if they actually have real love. So basically, if you follow any religion, the way it's supposed to be followed, so you get liberated, then you get liberation. Well, okay, liberation, let's, let's understand what is real liberation. Real liberation is becoming free of all misconceptions by which you become situated firmly in a path of devotion and love for God. So, like for example, Arjuna has misconceptions, right? When his misconceptions are over, what does he do? Does he go, does he go back to Godhead? No. He fights for Krishna. Right? And, and, and everything he does from the, the point that he's convinced that he should follow Krishna's order is under Krishna's instructions. So that is real liberation. If, if liberation is not geographical, in other words, I'm liberated in Vaikuntha, but as long as I'm in the material world, I'm not liberated. That's not real liberation. Liberation is like Narada Muni. He's liberated. Most of the time he's spending in the material world, preaching. But he's not affected by the material world. That's real liberation. No, what I meant was from the cycle of birth and death. Narada Muni is free of the cycle of birth and death. Right? But a person comes to material world only when he has this desire to, um, um, desire to enjoy this material world. That's why we are put into this uh, conditioned state. But Narada Muni is in the material world also. So, so this liberation is like, it's just like when you... Krishna like, comes to the material world. So when you actually go to that self-realization state, yeah. so it's a, it's a liberation about the consciousness, it doesn't matter you are in the material world. Liberation means you're free of all misconceptions, therefore you're fully engaged in the service of the Lord. And every minute you're focused on pleasing Krishna. That's, then you're a liberated person. You're no longer affected by anything. Nothing holds you back from always thinking about and serving Krishna. For uh, effects of this material world, world, world as uh, this thing, will it still be applicable to that oh, person? Well, yeah. Uh, okay. If you learn the seven principles of logic, you will not make a mistake. First principle. Yes? Reject anything that is not favorable That's the second. I know yes. the first. Wait, the second. Okay, point one. Accept everything favorable for Krishna consciousness. Point two. Reject everything that's not favorable. Point three. Seven point of logic? Yeah. 
Always remember Krishna. Point four. Never forget Krishna. Okay, don't look. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. Well, I, I forgot. Well, no, don't look. Don't no, listen. I remember when Lenin, Del, and Krishna. No, wait a minute. Point four is never forget Krishna, right? Yeah. Number five. Lenin, Del, and Krishna. Esku, Esku. Mickey Mouse. Who? Shikshara Diksha Guru. Guru. Right. Point six. Yes. Do only those things which are pleasing to the Lord. Yes. Point seven. Can you reload Point seven. Do not follow the philosophical No. Go ahead, look. Me? Yeah. Three points of triangle? What? Three points of triangle? Yes. yes. Subject. Guru. Test everything by the triangle of verification. Guru Shastra and Sadhu. Guru Shastra and Sadhu. It's Sadhu. It says Guru Shastra and Sadhu. Yeah, they didn't have a mistake in the No, that's wrong. It's, it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. Okay, so. If you follow these seven points of logic, you will not make a mistake. Even though we, we make, we, normal people make mistakes, but you will not make a mistake. That's why I'm te I taught you the seven points of logic. Did you get them? Yes, I read them just now. I read them just now. Yeah, you understand that this educational system is to bring you to the point where you don't make mistakes. That you become free of misconceptions. That your mind can focus on Krishna 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter you're working or this thing or that thing, but the, 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 the goal of life is set. Therefore, everything else will be organized to reach that goal of life. Okay. Do you feel misconceptions also being now? Of, uh, kind of process. Yes. Yes. Okay, no, we can't have all this noise going on, you know. This, this is not this is not a kindergarten, it's, it's a class. Yeah. What? What? Palena Parichete. Yes. So, as you said, judging from results, so Prabhupada also says that when we talk of different paths, you have to follow the same principle judging by result. Like, as you said, liberation is that you're always serving the Lord. So, Prabhupada says that um, if you see different paths, you have to judge them if they're getting the same results. That's how you know which is genuine. Which well, it's like. It's like. People are coming from different directions to Seattle. But once they get to Seattle, they're in the same place. Right? So, people might come through Islam, people might come through Christianity, people might come through Judaism, people might come through Sikhism, people might come through Jainism. But if they come to the same place, Savai Pumsa Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Rahamsa Ahaitukiya Patihata Yayat Master Prasiddhi. What does this mean? That Paro Dharma, pure Dharma or pure love of God, right, is uh, uninterrupted love of God with no personal motive other than to please the Lord. There's no s philosophical speculation, there's no uh, self interested work. It's only actions performed out of love of God, right? And it's uninterrupted. There's no vacations and things. So that's that's the definition of pure love. If someone achieves it through this path or the other path, it doesn't matter. They get to the same place. But unless that one has a clear concept to his God, uh, the 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 pure love. It, there might be some love, but it might not be pure. Right? And that's because there has to be knowledge also. 
how to please God. Just like, uh, okay, that's why I brought this today, because uh, this is a new little booklet I've, I've written about the uh, close connection between Gaudiya Vaishnavas and Sri Vaishnavas. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, this Srila Prabhupada makes a very good point. First of all, Sri Vaishnavas and the Gaudiya Vaishnavas are two sampradayas. Right? They're both Vaishnava sampradayas, but they don't have exactly the same, uh, let's say, gurus in their line. However, the Siddhanta is the same. The Siddhanta means, and this is it's very important to understand what Siddhanta means. It means the conclusions that enables people to attain love of God and liberation from the cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease, and by which they fully surrender to uh, the cause of, uh, of serving Krishna. So that's called Siddhanta. Now, there can be a difference of Sampradaya, but the Siddhanta is the same. So, uh, Prabhupada was asked direct questions about this, whether the Siddhanta of the Sri Vaishnavas and the Gaudiya Vaishnavas were the same. And every time he said yes, and then he gave the proof. He proved it. Now, uh, however, after proving it, he also explained that the Sri Vaishnavas are aiming for Vaikuntha and Sriman Narayana. Right? And the Gaudiya Vaishnavas are aiming for Goloka and Radha and Krishna. Uh, and, of course, Lakshmi Narayana and Vaikuntha, but Radha and Krishna and Goloka. Now, is there a difference there? No. There's no difference between Krishna and, and Lord Narayana. But there is a slight difference in rasa, in sweetness of relationship. So in Vaikuntha, uh, Ramanujacharya, he was teaching servitorship and the lower part of friendship, of Sakyarasa, of, of uh, Dasyarasa and Sakyarasa. But in Goloka, Lord Chaitanya was, was teaching the higher part of Sakya Rasa and, and Vatsali Rasa and Madhurya Rasa. So, both Vaikuntha and Gol Gol Goloka are in the spiritual world. Both are states of liberation. But there are slight differences in the relationships one can cultivate and the degree of sweetness. Because Krishna has four qualities that even Lord Narayana doesn't have. And they are uh, the uh, very sweet pastimes. Very, very sweet pastimes. Right? Where he's stealing butter, doing all these different things that melt your heart. And then uh, the gopis. The gopis who are completely dedicated to the Lord they have no consideration of sense gratification for themselves. They, 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 ex, they are convinced that their body, their life, everything is only for the pleasure of the Lord. They're not seeking any pleasure themselves. So their relationship is unbelievable. And then uh, the uh, Krishna's flute. The flute of Krishna is exceptional. There's nothing comparable to it. And, and Narayana doesn't have a flu. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the beauty of Krishna. So these four things even Lord Narayana doesn't have. Lord Narayana is beautiful, but, but the beauty of Krishna is unimaginable. Right? So, therefore, Although it's the same person, but there are there's a slight difference in relationship and sweetness. Right. 
Okay, so the Siddhanta is the same. Whether you, you read the Alvars, you read uh, Tirupavai, you read uh, Yamunacharya, you read King Kalushakar, they're all glorifying Krishna. Either in his original form or as Narayana. Uh, however, the relationship with the Lord uh, it, it differs. Now, I'm just going to read one part of this. This is revealed by uh, Bhaktivinoda Dakura in, in the book he wrote called Navidvip Mahatmya, Glorification of Navidvip. I'll just read this real quick. Srila Prabhupada has glorified. Uh, wait a minute, one second. Yeah. Srila Prabhupada has glorified Ramanujacharya throughout his voluminous books. We can garner from the above that the relationship between the Alvar saints and Ramanujacharya, who are the greatest proponents of the Sri Vaishnavas, are eternally united by their Siddhanta to the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. The following narration is from the Navadvip Mahatmya, glorification of the appearance place of Lord Chaitanya in Bengal, by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. It describes the mystical discussion between Ramanujacharya and Lord Jagannath, the deity of Lord Krishna in Puri. The Lord inspired Ramanuja to go to Navadri privately and meet Lord Chaitanya 300 years before the Lord appeared to receive his benediction. So now it's 300 years before Lord Chaitanya appeared like in the 15th century, 300 years before that, Ramanujacharya visited Jagannath Puri, and Lord Jagannath spoke to him personally and told him to go to Navadvip. Okay. Ramanujacharya once came to Jagannath Puri. He pleased Lord Jagannath with choice verses of glorification spoken with genuine love and devotion. Why did he go to Jagannath Puri? He went to all the major divyadeshams or holy places for Sri Vaishnavas. And he tried to establish the Pancha Trikibidi style of worship that he established in Sri Rangam. Like he went to Tirupati, but people in Tirupati didn't accept. And he went to Jagannath Puri, and they didn't accept there either. Right? But, while, but in many other places they accepted. Right? So when he goes to Jagannath Puri, he pleases the Lord so much that Lord Jagannath actually speaks to him. He pleased Lord Jagannath with choice verses of glorification spoken with genuine love and devotion. Jagannatha appeared before him and said, Go and see Navadvipa Dhamma, for soon I shall appear there in the house of Jagannath Mishra. Navadvipa is my very dear Dhamma, or transcendental abode, situated in one place in the spiritual sky. As my eternal servant and a leading devotee, you should see, see Navadvipa. Let your students who are absorbed in Dasya Rasa stay here, meaning in Jagannath Puri, and you go alone. Any living being who does not see Navadvipa has been born uselessly. Just one portion of Navadvipa contains Sri Ranga, uh, contains Ranga, Venkata, and Yadava Achala, meaning uh, Sri Ranga, where Ranganath is worshipped, Venkata, meaning uh, where uh, Balaji is worship and Yadava Achala, I think, is uh, uh, Varadaraj, I think. Therefore, go to Navadvip and see the form of Guranga. He's saying all these holy tirthas are in Navadvip also, including Vrindavan. You have come to the earth to preach bhakti, so let your birth be successful with the mercy of Gurahari or Lord Chaitanya. From Navadvipa, go to Kurmastana and there join again with your disciples. Joining his hands, Ramanuja made a request to Jagannath. You have mercifully mentioned Goranga, but exactly who is he? I do, I do not know. Lord Jagannath answered, Everyone knows the master of Goloka, Krishna. That Krishna, whose Vilasa Murti, or pastime expansion, is Narayana, is the supreme truth residing in Vrindavana. That Krishna is fully manifested in the form of Goranga, and Navadvipa Dhamma is the same as Vrindavana. 
This Navadvipa is the topmost abode, situated beyond the material universe, and in that place, Goranga stays eternally. By my mercy, that Dhamma has come to exist within Bhumandala, meaning in this world, yet remaining unaffected by Maya. This is the verdict of scripture. And if you think that Navadvipa is only a material location, then your devotion will perish. By my will, my inconceivable energy preserves this full transcendental Dhamma within the material world. Simply by reading scriptures, one will not get the highest truth. For the highest truth surpasses all reasoning power. Only the devotees, by my mercy, can understand. Hearing the words of the Lord, Ramanuja was moved with prema, love. Lord, your lila, or pastimes, are truly astounding. The scriptures cannot know your opulence. Why is not Goranga lila described clearly in the scriptures? When I closely examine the scruti and the Puranas, I find some hint of the Goranga tattva only. Now, however, I am ready to serve your order, for all doubts are gone. If it is your desire, I will go to Navadvipa and preach Gora Lila throughout the three worlds, giving evidence from the hidden scriptures to all the people, converting all to devotional service to Goranga. Please instruct me. Jagannatha said, Ramanuja, do not broadcast this now. Keep the esoteric Gora Lila secret. Only after he has finished his Lila will the general public receive it. Preach for me on the level of Dasya Rasa, servitude, while in your heart worship Goranga constantly. Taking advice of the Lord, Ramanuja secretly cultured his attraction for Navadvipa. Lord Narayana, being merciful, led Ramanuja to Vaikuntha, and there showed him his transcendental form served by Sri, Bhu, and Nila. Ramanuja thought himself fortunate to obtain the starshan, but instantly the figure changed to that of Gora Sundara, Lord Chaitanya, the son of Jagannath Mishra. Ramanuja swooned at the brilliance of the form. Goranga put his lotus feet on Ramanuja's head. Ramanuja, divinely inspired, recited prayers of praise. I must see Gora's actual lila on earth. I can never leave Navadvipa. Goranga said, Your wish will be fulfilled, son of Keshava. When the Nadia lila will be revealed in the future, you will take birth here. Goranga disappeared. Ramanuja, contented, resumed his journey. After some days, he arrived at Kurmashtana with his disciples and continued his preaching. During his life he preached Dasya Rasa throughout the south of India, while internally he was absorbed in Gora Lila. By Goranga's mercy, he was later born in Navadri as the devotee Ananta. These confidential truths are revealed by the Vaishnava Acharya so that devotees avoid quarreling and making artificial boundaries based on incomplete knowledge of the esoteric truths of spiritual life. Let us all glorify Ramanujacharya, one of the greatest spiritual teachers of all time. We should learn from him that all caste differences are irrelevant, irrelevant for spiritual advancement, as long as one listens to and follows the instructions of bona fide representatives of Lord Krishna. Now Malvar was born in a low caste family, yet he is considered the most prominent Alvar saint. Ramanujacharya accepted two gurus who were born in low caste families. We must stay glued to the instructions of the great Acharyas who are sincere and honest representatives of Lord Krishna, the original guru and teacher who spoke the Bhagavad Gita over 500 years ago. The Gita is the best scripture. This is confirmed by Srila Prabhupada who writes, but ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Out of many standard and authoritative revealed scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita is the best. Anyway, you get the idea. Ramanujacharya actually met Lord Chaitanya before the Lord appeared. And he fell in love with him. But Lord Chaitanya said, you continue to teach Dasya Rasa. When I come, I will teach Harinam Sankirtan and Madhurya Rasa. Uh, so, we see that there are different areas of, of the spiritual world where the different rasas are uh, manifest. So you have Santa Rasa, Dasya Rasa, and Sakya Rasa, Vatsalya Rasa, and Madhurya Rasa. You know, Santa means the relationship of neutrality. So like the grass in the spiritual world.
are devotees. Each blade is a devotee. And they're always contemplating, when will Krishna step on me so I can taste the sweetness of his lotus feet? The grass doesn't actively serve the Lord, but the grass waits for the Lord's mercy. Then there's dasirasa, servitorship. Just like Arjuna is a servant of Krishna. Hanuman is serving Lord Rama. And then there's two levels of it. One is the lower dasa rasa, where one serves with awe and reverence. And the higher rasa, where one serves equal to Krishna. Like in the gopas, some of them consider themselves equal to Krishna. And it's extremely intimate. Uh, whereas in the lower dasa rasa, it's form, everything is formalized. And we worship with awe and reverence. So the devotees, who are the sevaks, the servants of uh, uh, Ranganath or Padmanabha or Vadadaraj or Balaji, they do everything with very strict ritual performances and with, and with great respect. But when you come to Goloka, the Dasya Rasa is extremely intimate. Even Arjuna, uh, once he realizes that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God, he apologizes. He says, Please excuse me, Krishna, sometimes. I would rest my head on your lap and dangle my feet in the, in the air and, and speak to you as if you're my, my friend. <laughs> and he realizes, I, actually I was disrespecting you. You are the Supreme Personality of God, and you are the Virat Rupa, you are uh, Narayana, and, and I uh, mistook you to be my friend. Right? Um, but in, in the spiritual world, the Gopas, they, they consider themselves equal to Krishna. And they play with him as if he's an equal friend. Right? It's very intimate. And then above that you have the uh, uh, Vatsalya Rasa, this uh, parenthood, where the parents just consider themselves the protectors of Krishna. Right? And, and they have very sweet pastimes. Mother Yasoda will catch Krishna, tie him up, scold him. Uh, insist that he has to come home and eat and so forth. And then uh, Madhurya Rasa, which is uh, uh, pure love. And it's not the love that people can understand in the material world. It's the gopis, their only thought is to please Krishna. They think their body belongs to Krishna. They dress for Krishna. They do everything for Krishna. There's no, sense, no, no idea of sense gratification. The mind of the gopis. There's only pleasing Krishna. Okay, so here we see that uh, this intense love of Krishna is manifested by Lord Chaitanya and taught by Lord Chaitanya and the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Is there somewhat in Sri Vaishnavism also? If you look at Goda Devi or Andal, she in the Tirupavai, she goes to, to Vrindavan, she meets the gopis, she's trained by the gopis so that she can meet with Radha and Krishna and offer service to them. Then she goes back to Srinangam and eventually she marries Ranganath and then disappears into the body of Ranganath. And the same with the Bhisma Pitamaha, he was always worshipping, he knew Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the original Narayana, but his worshipable deity is Narayana. So when he, he's worshipping Parthasarati, or, or Krishna, the driver of the chariot, because when Krishna uh, protects Arjuna, he manifests his form as Arj, uh, Narayana and picks up the wheel as a chakra and runs toward Bhisma, Pitama. That's, what he, that's, that's his meditation. So when once Prabhupada was asked about that, and Prabhupada said it's a matter of uh, taste, Bhisma, Pita Maha, has this rasa, which uh, Krishna was called chivalric rasa, the rasa of bravery, of confrontation, of fighting, and, uh, and that's the way he sees the Lord. When, when Krishna kills a demon, he does it in the form of Narayana. Right. Or when he's fighting with Bhisma and running toward him with the, with the uh, wheel, Chakra, he's doing it in the form of Narayana. 
in the form of Krishna has a flute and he's dancing and playing his flute. So he doesn't he doesn't kill demons in his original form. So all these things are when it says esoterical, they defy normal logic based on uh, bodily conception and time space uh, factors of the material world. You, you enter into the fourth dimension with consciousness, purified consciousness, where everything is eternal, everything is, expands, and there's no more limitation of three dimensions. All three dimensions expand eternally. Right? So uh, there's an expansion of one's ability to comprehend things. And then and you see that Ramanuja, he actually goes to Vaikuntha and he sees Lord Narayana uh, with Devi and, and Nila and, and uh, 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 Lakshmi. But then, immediately he transforms into Lord Chaitanya. And now he's in Navadvip and the Lord advises him. And just like Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who's actually uh, the Brihaspati, uh, uh, the, the head guru of the devas. Right? Well, he didn't recognize Lord Chaitanya. He thought he was a sentimental sannyasi. And he tried to teach him Vedanta with the explanation by Sankaracharya. And Lord Chaitanya listened to him for seven days. And after seven days, he didn't ask any questions. He just sat there and listened. So Sarvabhama Bhattacharya said to him, well, what, you don't have any questions? You've been listening to me seven days. You've understood everything? And Lord Chaitanya said, well, I understood all the verses, but I couldn't understand your explanations of the verses. In other words, in a very nice way, he said, everything you said was nonsense. So... <laughs> Uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya understood what he, what he meant. He said, okay, well, I mean, you want to explain the verses then to me? And then Lord Chaitanya began to explain to him. And then Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, who was the top uh, Brahmin and intellectual, and he's Bihaspati originally, he was stunned. He had never seen anyone who could explain the, the, the Vedic literature like Lord Chaitanya. And then he, that night he was praying to Saraswati, saying, what's going on here? He said, I've, I've never met anybody like this. You know, he, he, he baffled me. He called me, basically he called me a fool, and then now he what he explained to me, I, I had difficulty imagining that someone could know the Shastra as, as, as well as he does. And then Saraswati said, you have to go and surrender to him. So the next day he went and surrendered to Lord Chaitanya and became a pure devotee. So, uh, we don't understand yet, you know, the, who is Lord Chaitanya and exactly what is he teaching. And we can understand chanting Hare Krishna, Kirtan, 